My name is Odie Hawkins. Uh, I'm a writer. My background of writing stemmed from absorbing stories and making an effort to regurgitate them, regurgitate them in print. My background educationally does exist. I joke about it by saying I'm from SWU, Sidewalk University. Initially, uh, as an African American uh, who was very pissed off about uh, his position in America, uh, I was either going to write or box or play soccer or do something that would help me uh, shred off the anger I felt. So writing helped being, uh, by being a creative outlet. I picked up a ballpoint. No, I picked up a number two pencil. That was the beginning. I picked up a new pen, number two pencil and a uh, 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 legal pad and I started writing. I think the writing thing happened to me because of uh, three uh, uncles from Mississippi who used to tell stories all around me. And I discovered that uh, I was interested in uh, repeating their stories in print, not by painting. I'm 81 now, and I was eight. I can pinpoint eight when I started. So that means I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, I'm totally confident. I can say whatever I want to say in print. I may not be grammatically up to snuff, but I feel very certain and very capable of saying what I want to say in print about what I want to talk about. I'm coming from a very, a very cocksure group of people from Mississippi and Arkansas who felt that if they could make it in Chicago after having what they had coped with down home, then we could make it anywhere. So the first book was called Ghetto Sketches and it stems directly from what I just said concerning the people who told stories all around me. And I wanted to tell their stories. I felt the best way to do it was to take a street on the west side of Chicago and go up one side of the street and down the other side and tell all the stories that I saw in all of the houses. It was a very ambitious undertaking and it succeeded. Uh, Dr. Margaret Burroughs, who was my first mentor uh, and teacher, uh, took the ghetto sketches and made the first part of a curriculum at Kennedy King in Chicago. The book was published in 1972 and by 73 or 74, it was part of a curriculum. And thus far, it has been on the curriculum of uh, several other people, Dr. Justin Gifford, who teaches at the University of Nevada, uh, has used it as a part of his curriculum. So that was the first one. The first published book, I was 34, 35. I came into the game late, but I've been doing it for a while, like most people. You know, I discovered what I wanted to be, but I had to go uphill against all the things that would prevent me from becoming that. I was supposed to have become a thief, a hoodlum, uh, maybe a boxer, or something like that. But uh, the reaction from some quarters of academia was receptive. I, I hesitate to say this because it sounds negative, but black academia uh, found itself in a quandary about how to deal with those of us who were coming from the streets who wanted to talk about uh, things that were relative to our experience. They didn't want to hear that. They had been uh, mostly conditioned to accept people who were coming from uh, educations, educa educational background. I'm talking about the, the Ellisons and uh, uh, Langston Hughes and people like that came out of the Harlem Renaissance who had very good educations. The later, the later stream I'm talking about people like Donald Goins and Jonah Zell, uh, Iceberg Slim, and myself. Uh, we weren't coming from academia, we were coming from SWU. I publish output at this point, if I'm not mistaken, it's about 38. Maybe 40, I'm becoming absent-minded in my old age.
First, I wanted to tell the stories of the stories that I've been listening to. Secondly, I wanted to become a famous, rich, well-known African-American author so that I could travel and do all the stuff I wanted to do. I had a viciously ambitious aim in mind, and thus far it's been proven out. Uh, as a result of my writing, I've been able to ascend to a plateau of sheer ecstasy, creatively. My wife can explain the other part. Oh my God, man, you asked the magic question. Dr. Margaret Burroughs, who was my high school teacher, forced me to write. She found me, uh, she picked up a piece, of, a piece of paper that I've been writing that had something that might be considered profane or obscene on it, and I thought I, I failed the class and so forth. She didn't look at it that way. She said, you need to go to a writing class, and she sent me to one with a woman named Mr. Margaret Peterson. Margaret Peterson, uh, a white woman who was working on the South Side of Chicago, which is, was as black as any African country at the time. We're talking about 1952. And uh, that was my start. But Dr. Margaret Burroughs, who started the first African American Museum of History, uh, the Museum of African American History at Chicago, the DuSable Museum of African American History. So she was uh, both a push and a shelf <laughs> and a, an impetus to do that. Uh, traditional publishing was uh, a torture and uh, an exercise in patience and a number of other things that are, it would take too long to talk about. But what it meant traditionally is that as a writer, especially as an African American writer, you were not privileged to have, in most cases, you were not privileged to have an agent who would take your work, present it to a major publishing company, let's say uh, uh, Random House or Little and Brown or whatever these people, who would then take a year or two and explain to you that if you change certain kind of things that didn't meet their particular cultural norms, they might publish you. Self-publishing uh, opens another door because print-on-demand publishing means that I can write anything I want to subject to certain kinds of little specifications. I believe Author House, for example, has a stipulation that people in a novel about sex shouldn't have sex before 18. Some ridiculous puritanical American values that they superimpose on the, the writer. We know that people have sex before 18. But, on the other hand, they will publish the novel. Uh, you can make an effort to have things edited by another separate set of people who will then charge you a little bit more money. But basically the fact, the, the, the flat rate of what they're saying to you, you can have it published, you can uh, have your own cover designed, and it will be distributed through Barnes and Nobles and Amazon.com and so forth. People can Google your name and come up with Otis Sanders and there you go. I like being my own boss. My own boss is Arthur House. I can tell Arthur House what to do. If they don't like what I tell them, they can. In this day and age, in this 21st century, uh, going through uh, the medium that we're dealing with right now, I can advertise my books through what I'm doing right now. I'm sure that I've gained at least 20 customers, clients, potential readers, by being on your program. Thank you, Otis. I'm provocative, uh, I'm interested, I'm a hell of a creative writer, and I have a fan base that dates back to 1972. So, uh, I'm doing okay. Being, being very commercial for a minute, I want a superior product. Uh, I've been a writing teacher for like 40 some years. And when I ask, uh, I'm asking the same thing of myself that I want from my students, which is a finished product should be a superior product. 
uh, I want to be put at the same level as Vladimir Nabokov or John Chiro Tanazaki or Nikos Kanzastakis or any Olusayenka or Chino Achebe. I want to be in, uh, did I miss uh, Zora Neale Hurston? I, I meant to mention some ladies there, I missed them. But yeah, it should be a superior product. The best is yet to come. If I live to be 90, I will write the superb novel that I've been trying to write for the last 70 some years. And I'm looking forward to that. It would be one that I'm satisfied with. I'm not, I, I've been privileged not to uh, have to look at what people think of me. It's what I think of me. If I were to consider each one of the previously published books a stair, a, a rung on a ladder, I'm constantly climbing upwards. Hopefully, hopefully, the, the very last book that I've had published by Arthur Hoth is called uh, Ancestral Meridians. I think that book is better than black, uh, white, and brown or the blue line. And then we go down and uh, as I climb upwards, each book, each recently published book should be better than the previous one. And no one can determine that other than the critics and myself. Sometimes the critics have been more generous to me than I have been to myself. What we have to understand now is that this is 2018 that a lot of people don't know how to read. They are into texting, they're into e emails, so they've forgotten the art of reading. Writers who know how to write, write for people who know how to read. And our, our fan base is shrinking. It's very encouraging for those of us who uh, in the creative field, whether it be writing, painting, so forth. Uh, I like the idea that uh, we are creatively supporting each other, doing, for example, exactly what you're doing, which is to target me, a guy you met at a birthday party, or uh, as uh, our friend uh, Roger calls it, a celebration of life. We went, uh, we met each other, we connected, we networked, and here we are. And I think we should do as much as, as we possibly can.